whole the homestead around our place, no man was there. No father, no husband was around. They were all taken. Those who were much slightly younger decided they should not be arrested. So they moved to the forest and started fighting from there. Okay, I'm Gozo Wakariuki, and I am a professor of accounting. I was born in Muranga, in Kagema, a division at that time, and uh, I grew up there until after school. So. My knowledge of Mau Mau is that Mau Mau was very intense in our area. We were young people growing up. And when you talk about Mau Mau, we remember that uh, the schools were closed in our place from 1953 up to 1959 or 60 when the emergency was uh, lifted. So in terms of um, growing up, we grew up at that time. We came, we educated at Nairobi University, started teaching there. Over the years, then we did some politics and we were um, detained. Went out of the country and came back after the Mount Party. But uh, here is the story of Mau Mau. One, important feature about Mau Mau was that we were all villagerized. I don't know whether it's understandable what it is. We used to live each in their own homesteads. But during the, after the declaration of emergency, we were all taken to villages which were surrounded with a big trench and spikes. So we lived in the villages. Our parents would go and do the job. I would do some work, forced labor, in the land, in the farms of the homeland, uh, home guards and um, chiefs, and the people who are with the colonial government. Then we, as young people, would be left at, ho at in the village. One of the things I can say is, uh, and I remember we were young, but each one of us had to take the Mau Mau oath. Anybody who was born then had to take the Mau Mau oath. And the young people were used as scouts so that if a message is required to be taken from here to a uh, town, you would be told the words to go and see, say to the person you will find there. Very decoded message. And then you would come back and say, yeah, I met that person and I said this. And as we grew up, we got used to that. We now started understanding that there is a war going on. Because as you walk around, you would also see um, the home guards. What happened was that our parents were in detention. Our fathers were in detention. There were other people who were in the countryside who are not in detention. My, what we call in Kikuyu, Fafa Muni, was around. So what he used to do during the day is organize us, we go and collect, get firewood, make some food, which would be taken to the Mau Mau in the evening or in the afternoon near the forest. Because we come from very close to Abadaya, Abadaya Mountains, which was called Nyandarwa. And as you may have known in history, one of the teams uh, fighting for the war was in Nyandarwa. I think Ibaria Kanio, the general, was there. And uh, then you would walk up. There were no vehicles. You would walk from one village to the next. Then you give your food there, or food stuff. Then those others would take to the next village. 
until it reached the Mau Mau. And in the evenings also, Mau Mau would walk around the, the farms, the, the, the shambas where we had built, walking around, saying what their needs are, asking what happened. Then during the day, Mau Mau would not be anywhere to be found. Even like my Papa Munyi, daytime he would hide. Then we would go collect firewood, but he's hiding. So we shall go and call him when those people have done their round. And then in the evening, Mau Mau would be around. Daytime is the home guard. Maybe it's good to explain what uh, it was. Those people who were not in detention or in the forest fighting, who are, uh, who are grown up men, were either the home guards, home guards were those who were employed by the British government to fight against the Mau Mau, or were those urban, we can call them outside the guerrillas, who were not in the forest but they were part of the Mau Mau. Nobody had, everybody had a role. Um, those home guards would come during the day walking around. Who came yesterday? Even as young people, you had been trained never to say anything to someone you never knew. And uh, the other thing that was uh, critical was that um, there was a lot of hunger. You know, so that people could surrender, all the women were collected every morning, go and work for the chiefs and the other people. Late in the evening, about four, they would be given one hour, go to your farm now, collect some food, take it to your people in the village. Let me ask, um, when the emergency was declared, yeah. Were you in school yet? Or? When emergency was declared... Where were you? Were you in school or you were... We, we were going to, the, to school. We went to primary school. But then the schools were closed. And then we had to go back now to the... And stay without school. But there were no schools going on, except there was one school which was a missionary school called Jobe, but those people who had to go there had to be taken in by their scullies. Okay. So they were children of the royal, royal, they were called royal people, those who are loyal or home guards. And they had to go, uh, they had to be taken. So for you to be taken, then they had to have scrutinized that uh, you have nothing to do with the, the Mau Mau. When the villagization was being implemented, yeah. Villagialization, uh, you know, uh, uh, currently the way we are, in the villages, if you know, every people have a homestead. Even those days, people used to have a homestead surrounded by a good round fence. The young men would build there, the parents would be there, the wuka would be somewhere there. They were homestead. But villagialization was to remove people from their individual homes to put them in one large concentration camp. It was like a concentration camp. The difficult thing is that, young as we were, we were the ones who helped our mothers build the houses. You had to go there, collect the rafters, go help friends, and immediately we did it with mud. Now, uh, tell us about life in the village. Life in the village. You know what happened? The village, one thing I can say is hunger. There was a lot of hunger. Because our mothers would go farm only one hour per day. The other time they are working for the chiefs and the home guards. So when they come in the evening with a banana or with some maize, they, you would eat a little, and the other one you are told you eat during the day tomorrow. And uh, what used to happen then, the people who are, are loyal, they, their homesteads were somewhere near the camp. Like I told you, there was always a big tower 
where someone would sit to watch the other villagers. The loyal people would be on that side. You, the other children of Homga, uh, children of Mau Mau and Tenis, you would be on the other side. So sometimes we would go there and ask for support. And you know, I don't know whether you know sugar canes. Mm. Uh, the stalk of maize is like a sugar cane. So when they cut the top ones for the cows, they would keep the rest for us. That's what you would do during the day, eating. And then also, there are times that um, there was, now if I remember that area, there was a time there was these people, I think the Catholic, the Catholic people, the Catholic fathers or no, started coming to the villages, giving some food, and you would line up, get something like they, they give now to people who, are, um, who have no food. And then your parents would come with the bananas. Luckily, the farms, the shambas, were still growing some bananas, potatoes, but there was hunger because I remember sometimes that when you have a maize, instead of uh, when you are roasting it, you would then share each, each boy. You take one grain, the other one one grain, the other one, and you cannot take two because you are going to finish for the others. <coughs> Hunger was something that was in... Um, let alone, there, was some, there were jiggers. That jiggers were all over, especially the old, the old generation who did not go because of their age. Jiggers would take, you would be full of jiggers there, and then, what happened towards the end of emergency, they built tunnel, tunnels of, uh, they would put some medicine. You would walk so that you are not affected by the jiggers. For some reason, jiggers were, let alone, it was, a, it was said that jiggers had been brought as a biological, biological war, warfare. The other thing was when you are sleeping, you sleep on the floor. There were, either you go, in the, when there were bananas, you would get some banana st stalks, arrange a sort of something called kefari, you would be sleeping there. So down there also there were rice and freeze, which again, let alone as uh, independence came, it was said that people, it was another biological war. Because you are either having free, or you are having rice, or you are having jiggers. And uh, it was a really bad life. So all the houses were burnt. The ones in the countryside were burnt. So everybody had now to go to the village. That was also another way of starving the Mau Mau, because they would not, when they come, they would not find anybody in the farms. And they would not be able to go to the village because now the village was surrounded. All the homesteads around our place, no man was there. No father, no husband was around. They were all taken. Those who were much slightly younger decided they could not be arrested. So they moved to the forest and started fighting from there. So the village then was the very young people, uh, those who are about 10, 12, of those who are left. And then they were also trained never to talk to people they don't know. And that's why I'm saying they were, uh, we were all trained how to take messages. We could tell what was happening, we knew. You know, the process is about 52. 53, 54, everything is going on. In, in spite of the, uh, the, the Askari is being very vigilant, all, Mau Mau are also doing all the other things in the villages. They would come, collect the boys, take them somewhere by the river, early morning, then it disappear. Remember, the, because there was a lot of bush, it was easier for the, those people to come, do their work, hide, and then go take you back to the, uh, to the houses. Now it became difficult when it came to, to the village, because in the village now, everybody was locked. 
those who are going out, they, they are guarded by, they would be divided into groups of 10, 10 or so to go and work. And then they had an Ascari or two Ascaris behind them. Then young men would be left. But what would happen is that uh, in the village, people were also trained that we could go where the fence is, you could go and uplift some of the fence part, get out, sneak out, go to the bush, maybe bring food for the others, or maybe go and be sent by the Mau Mau. After the villagerization, life became difficult, both for the Mau Mau and for the people outside, because now you are separated. And that is, the, uh, if you take a map of our place, Kagema, you will see that very close to Abadea Mountains, there was a tunnel. People had to be forced also to, be a, to be, dig a tunnel so that you cannot go across and the others cannot come across. But somehow, people were ingenious, they were able to, to reach them there. Except now, much later, when in the villages, there were, we have called them home guards or Kamatimo, and they would also be very vigilant. There were some who, who gave up, who would give up, and then surrender. And when they surrender, they would now be used to locate homes where there are men who come in the evening. Uh -huh. so you mentioned the name Kamatimo. Yeah. Who are these? You know, the soldiers, the African soldiers were not given, uh, some of them were not given guns, were given Itimo is a spear. So Kamatimo were the people, lower rank of the soldiers, who are not given guns, but they had the spears. Kamatimo is someone who is carrying the spear. But they were on the side of the colonizer. They were on the side of the uh, uh, white men. And they are the same ones now home, called home guards. Uh, the word home guard came, uh, in Kikuyu it was home guard, but it, it is in English home guards. They were called home guards by the whites, but in Kikuyu they were called home guard. So if you, someone is called a home guard, you knew that that was an enemy, outright. Sometimes the um, home guards would surround Mau Mau and kill them, but there was one very famous incident Later on, we learned it was about maybe 55, 56. There was a, a district officer, Dio. Now again in Kikuyu, you call them Dio, in Kagema. And then what happened was that um, he had organized very fires, Kamatimo, and home guards. What happened was that uh, General Kago, we were told later, General Kago organized a team of commandos. They came to a place called Irwadia. So what they did was somewhere they were able to penetrate the home guard camp and wear the uniforms. The, the Mau Mau, some came from the forest and then the others were the Komerera who were around. They waited for the DC, for the DO. The DO would walk, talk, move around, there was a, a Land Rover. That was our first time to see some vehicles. Move around, move around, and then talk. So this particular time, the, the DO went somewhere and talked to the villagers and told them how they are going to finish Mau Mau. We remember one of the women was beaten. You know, the whole village is brought together. Then a woman was beaten to death to just warn the other people, including the young, we the young, that don't help. If you do it, you are done. So now the home guards, uh, no, no, no. Now the Mauma were like home guards. So they waited in a river called Mazioya. And then he waited for the Dio 
The duo was called Calda. I think in English it's K-A-L-D-E-R. But in Kikuyu, he was called Kadara. So he came, and the soldiers, pretend, now the pretentious uh, scallies, asked him to do, uh, what do you call it, parade, to inspect on a parade in Madioya. So after he finished to the end, uh, to the end, the Mau Mau, now the, those who are wearing the Ascari uniform were Mau Mau, took him, cut his hand, and uh, blew a trumpet, forced the driver to take the body, the torso, take it to the, to the office in Kagema. Then General Kago and the team took the head to the Abadea forest. And that is when there was then a very violent attack in that area called Rwadia. And if you look at some records, there is what we call Muitowarwadia, which is the Rwadia massacre. And they came, killed everybody who was around, children, women, men. It was the result of that. And then there was a, 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 an imposition of a tax for everybody who was <coughs> an adult. We who are young couldn't, were not paying tax, but we would be forced to help our mothers to work so that they can raise the money. I think it was either 10 or 15 shillings for every adult to pay for that white D.O. who was massacred, not who was killed. General Kago was later on killed and uh, I think burnt in the Kadala. So we never saw him. But Baria Wakanio came from Kagema close to Abadea, but had been fighting from the other side of Naivasha. So Baria Kanio later on after independence we met him. He was alive and he would explain now to us those heroic moments. He was a general and he, he died, I don't know, I cannot remember exactly when he died, but must have, uh, it was much later after independence. Before independence, every village, those areas of Moranga where uh, I know every village had written a list of their people who had been uh, working for the white person. And they had done 12 of the December, 1963, every village had enough ropes for everybody who was a home guard. And it had been agreed they would be hanged as the flag goes up. But now, it so happened that uh, one in, the, in Kabu, one of the people whose names had been written was Muigai the son of President Kenyatta. And therefore, somewhere, Kenyatta had called people and told them, no, we cannot give a hyena twice. In Kikuyu is, if someone is killed, he was a Because if you kill someone and we kill you, it means we are giving hyena two people to eat. Then Kenyatta said, we forgive, but we don't forget. So all the ropes, I told just go keep them, nobody will be hanged. So that history then became a bit convoluted. And uh, that's why most people who are themselves in that line have tried to defend themselves, that they were just doing, someone had to do the work. And then schools reopened again in 1959. So we had to go back to school and that is when now we waited for about, it is about three other years, 1963, independence came. Uh, in places where there was war, let's say everywhere, there was always a division between these people and those people. You go to Meru, you will still find the people who are on the side of Mau Mau, the people who are on the side of the um, uh, British home guards. Home Gati, Kamatimo, and there were songs created then.
to sing against those people. Now, in the, as we, uh, going back, in uh, growing up, nobody was trained how to cock a gun. If it happened and you are a young person and you found a gun somewhere, because sometimes some of the Mau Mau might be shot and then threw a gun away, you are supposed to wait for, keep it, hide it, cover it, and go and then tell your mother, who would then know who to tell her in that area. Because, like I said earlier, all men had gone to the forest yeah. or were in detention. But there were men who remained there, who were now the um, scouting for Mau Mau. Sometimes they would wear women dresses, so that when women are called to go and do, do some work for the chief, these men would go, and he's organizing. But they would be wearing women clothes, and then they would be organizing the women. After this, we shall know who will bring the food where. So it was really an intense war which um, involved everybody. Now, when uh, Dr. Keno returned in 1956, 1957, 56, 57. Uh, do you remember that period? Yeah, uh, Dr. Keno became very famous because he was uh, the most educated person uh, in that area. That is when they also started in our, some negotiations about independence. But before Dr. Keno, there was someone called, I don't know you have heard of it, Professor, Kemaniwalu, Kemaniwa Jona. He was in, uh, the first graduate in our area. And he went to Fort Hare University, came back around 1952-53, and he was immediately absorbed as a Mau Mau, as a secretary for Mau Mau. Uh, then he, later on, just before his parents, he had become a teacher, bought a motorcycle, and we were told he was hit by some land rover. His leg was cut. That was the first graduate we had about. Then Keanu became a doctor. Keanu was famous. He was, Keanu was used as an example of how you can become something if you went to school. Because there was also the problem, the, the group of the missionaries, even in between. In Kagema, there was a place called Wedaga, where there was a church. All the Christians would go there and be kept there so that they, because they had rejected to take the oath. And then they would be part of, uh, now they, they don't, they are not Mau Mau, they are not Home Guard, but they are just being protected. So Keanu was what we called Azomi. Azomi and all those people who have uh, gone through school properly. The Kariuki Jiri. Jiri, we heard about him. Uh, one thing is we had heard about Chief Jiri. The father was a chief. And the father, the story which is known about Jiri was that when the radio and the, uh, announced that Kenyatta would be released in 1963, he threw the radio out, and I think it is said, I'm saying they stole the, the folklore. He destroyed it with a spear. Because he said, you, the same radio, you are the one who told me Kenyatta will never come back. And now you have told me he will come back. And because Jiri was a, a chief during the, um, that a time of emergency, it, uh, when Kenyatta was released, and Kenyatta could go, not go to Lancaster because he, had, he was not a member of parliament, was not. Kariuki Jiri's son, uh, Jiri's son, Kariuki Jiri, now resigned his seat in Regico, that's the Legislative Assembly, to allow Kenyatta to become a member of parliament there, and he got to. 
that's how Jiri paid off his debt for the struggle for the Mau Mau. And now these were the latter years of the um, uh, late 50s, 60, 61. Kenyatta was released around 61. So now, you, you say schools were reopened 1958? 1958, 59, 58, depending. So went back to school? Yeah, we went, we went to school. Uh, what happened is, um, that time if you were about 12, 12 years or so, you are too big for standard one. But there were no standard ones. So you would go. The, the system was you are, you are the way to check whether you are older than you would be asked to touch. If you touch your, your other year there, it means you are bigger than starting the standard one. So you would be taken, started one one term, started two the other term, maybe then the other year you go to three. And the, after four years of primary, then you would do something called common entrance examination. Then you would go to another school. Mm -hmm. Common entrance examination, CE. Did you know Kamaru? You know, Kamaru, we were in school together. Kamaru. Now, note that we, we didn't go to the same school. Kamaru comes from where Mutuli Kekano, the current and people Kagema comes from. The Kamaru, we were, in around, we were in school around the same time. He reached the standard date. Remember that time was up to standard date. He went. I don't know whether he did a finish the standard date. Because we ourselves went up to standard eight, then we went to high school. No, standard eight, yeah, then you would go to, uh, to high school, then to higher. So we grew up that time. Kamalo was talented, he started seeing very early. In the early 60s, late 50s, he would sing. And because he had grown in Mau Mau, he has sang a lot of songs, those who may understand them, songs of Mau Mau. The passbook. Passbook. What, how did it used to, did everybody have one or when was it required? You know, after emergency was declared in Nairobi, in the country, anybody who was from Kikuyu, Ebo, Romero, was supposed to go back to the village to come back, you would be given a passbook. <laughs> Only later on, then Kefandi, the identity card, was introduced. Again, the idea of an, an identity card was almost now a replacement of the passbook. You could be identified. If, now that came to everybody. Everybody should have an ID, Kefandi, Kefandi house. This is where people, next to GPO, that's where the Kepadi house was for people who wanted to get an ID. But passbook was to allow you to pass from the village to the city, or to allow you to stay in the city and you could pass. Uh, what did you see them doing? What was their... Role, either for or against the a place called Wedaga, there was a man called Mac MacGregor, but uh, in Kikuyu, he was called Mangereka. So their role was to bring people, or the, especially women, who, who don't want to be in the village, who are Christians, they don't want the oath, they don't want anything to do with the oath, put them in a church and they would hold, they would keep them there. They would be doing some farming around the church, eat food there, seeing, to be baptized, to be told that what is happening, Mau Mau is an anti-Christian, anti godly thing. So in a way also, they were preaching against the, the Mau Mau. They were preaching against, not that there were no religion. Remember even in the old cultures, there were religion, there were religious issues where people would go 
Sirota da Mugumo Tri, play facing out Kenya. But now this one was to all those things are evil. Even Mau Mau is evil. And unfortunately, occasionally then, the Mau Mau who are around would go and attack the church and burn. But so it was a way of trying to save people for the white man who can become and their children were the first to be educated when the education started coming back. Is there any form of discrimination faced in the line of education simply because you are a Christian? In those days, being a Kikuyu was like a, was a crime. That's why the past book, Kikuyu Ebu Meru, you couldn't be in the city. You, certainly were a bad person according to the white man. Now, only if you, are, uh, you have accepted to be his supporter, who will be called home guard, or Kamatimo, the spear bearer. You know, during the Mau Mau, the white man used to preach to the other communities that Kikuyus, Ebu and Meru, those people, eat people. They are cannibals. So it was not just fear like that. It was fear that these people, they cut you, they drink your blood. And because of taking the oath, the oath itself was taken by using blood. So they preached that ah, these people don't play around with them. They can kill you and eat you. But it was, they were not killing like that. But it, blood was part of the ritual. The propaganda, propaganda was, uh, even when people are called in the village in the evening, it was propaganda. The women are being told, your husbands have died in the detention camp, they will never come back again, so you better support the um, home guards and support the white man who is here because this is your only life. Propaganda to demoralize and propaganda to demonize to demoralize people and to demonize the acts. What can you say about standing in Olenge and his antagonism with Omar? Well, now, standing in Madege is someone, I must say, we used to hear of him. He's a myth. And Kemadi, too, was a myth. For us in the villages, it was the spirit to keep you, I told you that it would be said, Kemadi will come here, but you won't see him. So tomorrow when you wake up, you know Kemadi was here when you were homestead. There are people who say there was disagreement. There are others who say Madege was sent as an emissary to go and look for or ammunition. So I think this one would be the historians to know the real history because nobody interviewed Madenge. I know there are people like General China who came out and they wrote their own books, but only someone who was inside there who would know. Well, those who, any, anybody who said that, it was called Sareda, who only Sareda. Even after independence, he better die. Those who died were better than those who surrendered. Now, I don't know about General China, but he wrote his own book, has explained it. But those people who knew him in the forest, they say he sort of was captured and then surrendered. And he, there is a difference between surrendering and being captured. You can be captured, then of course you surrender, then you give all the information you have, but you have been captured. Uh, those surrender, there are people who, when the plane went out saying, no, come out, but you would only walk out holding some leaf, some blunt, saying that you would be identified now as a surrender. You are coming from the forest, then you all sit there, then chiefs would come and take you. There are some who did it like that. And of course, 
they were cheated by the plane that day. Once they were captured after the surrender, they were detained. And then they started the process again. So you may find people who are in the forest after being captured or after surrendering went through the detention process. And then they were released. If you are to sum up the home of Mao, war, the experience you obtained, what would you say about Mao war was about? And did it what I can, what I can summarize is that Mau Mau War was a, a genuine war of people liberating themselves. And um, was a war that was well intentioned. And it is a war that forced the British to come to negotiate for independence in Kenya. The war achieved what every war achieves, that you reach a point when you become tired and then you say, let's go to the table. Uh, unfortunately, I must say, it was the beneficiaries were not the Mau Mau people. The adherents of Mau Mau were not the beneficiaries because they didn't conquer. You know, when you go to a war and you don't conquer militarily the way the Allied forces conquered Hitler and took over his capital, when you negotiate, you lose a lot. So the Mau Mau people were not properly honored after the war. But most of them have not complained about it. They feel genuine, they did it willingly, it was done deliberately, and it is the source of the independence of this country. Again, the only other war that was fought was the Algeria, they fought a war coping from Mau Mau. Zimbabwe, the Zanil army also copied from Mau Mau. So much as there are wars that it didn't, um, because when you negotiate for independence, there's a give and take. It's not a conquest. And that is what happened. It was a give and take. And Mau Mau were not educated people. They were not represented in the negotiations. Whoa.